Your Excellency the Prime Minister, Excellencies, Tashos, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Rick's Dialogue. A great historian once said that history is a study of change and not just a study of our past. According to him, people are usually afraid of change because they fear the unknown. But the single greatest constant of history is that everything changes. A great philosopher once said, the difference between religion and spirituality is that while religion is about answers, spirituality is about questions. In his view, religion is a deal whereas spirituality is a journey. And a great professor once said that the most important skills to survive and flourish in the 21st century are not any specific skills, like a computer code, but instead the skill, key skill is how to keep mastering new skills throughout our lives. According to him, we need to constantly reinvent ourselves to stay relevant. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that great historian, that great philosopher, and that great professor is none other than our most distinguished guest and speaker for this evening, Dr. Yuval Noah Harari. <laughs> Welcome, Professor. Welcome to Bhutan and welcome to the Rick's Dialogue. I know Professor Harari really needs no introduction, but nonetheless, as required by the format of our dialogue, I shall highlight a few key things from his very impressive CV. Professor Yuval Noah Harari is a historian, philosopher, and the best-selling author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Homo Deus, a Brief History of Tomorrow, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, and the series Sapiens, A Graphic History, and of course, the latest of his books is Unstoppable Us. His books have sold 40 million copies in 65 languages around the world. Professor Harari is considered one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world today. Born in Israel in 1976, Professor Harari received his PhD from the University of Oxford in 2002 and is currently a lecturer at the Department of History in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 2019, following the international success of his books, Professor Harari co-founded Sapienship with his husband and original agent, Itzik Yahab, Sapienship is a social impact company with projects in the fields of entertainment and education, whose main goal is to focus the public conversation on the most important global challenges facing the world today. Professor Harari gave keynote speeches on the future of humanity in Davos 2020 and 2018 on the World Economic Forum's main Congress hall stage. He regularly discusses global issues with heads of states and has had public conversations with several heads of governments around the world. In 2019, Professor Harari sat down for a filmed discussion on technology and the future of society with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. And in 2018, he presented the first ever TED Talk delivered by a digital avatar. Professor Yuval Noah Harari originally specialized in world history, medieval history, and military history. His current research focuses on macro historical questions such as what is the relationship between history and biology? What is the essential difference between Homo sapiens and other animals? Is there justice in history? Does history have a direction? Did people become happier as history unfolded? What ethical questions do science and technology raise in the 21st century? 
Professor Harari lectures around the world on the topics explored in his books and offers his knowledge and time to various audiences on a voluntary basis. He writes articles for publications such as The Guardian, The Financial Times, The New York Times, Time, and The Economist. In 2020, Professor Harari wrote and interviewed extensively on the global COVID-19 crisis, discussing the pandemic's implications on major news channels, including CNN and the BBC. And in 2022, he commented publicly on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with his article on this topic becoming The Guardian Opinion's most read opinion piece of all time. Professor Harari was featured in a prof profile piece on CBS's 60 Minutes program in 2021. We are extremely honored and delighted to have Professor Dr. Harari in our country and for the RICS Dialogue this evening. Dr. Harari is accompanied by his husband, Mr. Isaac Yahav, and a group of very prominent personalities from Israel who are all here in the audience with us this evening. To all of you, welcome to Bhutan and welcome to the RICS Dialogue. We are truly happy to have you with us. The dialogue tonight will be moderated by Dashukar Sitim, who again for the local audience at least needs no introduction. For the benefit of our international audience, Dashukar Sitim currently serves as the chairman of the National Service Corps Working Group and as member of the governing board and faculty at RICS. He also serves as a member of the governing board of the Duke Galpos Institute, an institution spearheading education reforms. He is also a member of the board for Bhutan National Bank and the Natural Resources Development Corporation. Prior to that, Dashuk Ahmad Sitim served as the chairman of the Royal Civil Service Commission and the secretary of the erstwhile Cross-National Happiness Commission. Dashu, welcome and thank you for consenting to moderate the dialogue. RICS, as most of us know, is a premier leadership institute and a think tank founded by no other than His Majesty the King in 2013, with the objective of promoting excellence in governance and leadership. Among the many programs that the Institute organize, organizes, the RICS Dialogue provides a unique platform to engage with eminent scholars experts and thought leaders from around the world and to learn from their expertise and their experience. I have no doubt that all of us here will have so much to take away from the conversation this evening. The dialogue format is, the dialogue will take uh, one hour and 30 minutes approximately. Uh, the moderator will engage with Dr. Harari for about 45 minutes uh, on various uh, subjects. And then we will open up uh, for audience questions for another 45 minutes. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are not very comfortable uh, to speak here in the hall, you might want to use, uh, log on to Slido. The event code, as you can see, is 13675575 and you may raise your questions uh, there. With this, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the RICS Dialogue, and I wish you all a great evening of sharing and learning. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tasho. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Song. Professor Harari, it's such a pleasure to have you here in Bhutan and to be able to host this uh, conversation. As a thought leader of our times, I would like to begin by asking you to make some opening remarks uh, that could touch upon the big ideas in your books, as well as what you see as your personal mission now that you have the attention of millions of people around the world. Mm. Um. So I, I think my basic mission is to try and focus the global conversation on the most important challenges that we face. Uh, because unfortunately we see that humanity is not really paying enough attention to these challenges. 
we are now facing three major challenges. The first one is uh, the ecological crisis, climate change and so forth. The second is technological disruption. And the third is the threat of global war, a nuclear war. Now, um, the ecological threat, we understand it. We know what we should be doing, but we don't do it. With the technological threat, it's even more complicated because we don't understand what we are facing and what we should be doing. Um, the pace of technological development is such that most people around the world, including even senior politicians and business people, they don't understand what we are facing. Just over the last few months, we've seen a tremendous leap in the abilities of artificial intelligence, which our mind struggles to comprehend what is happening and what are the implications. We'll talk about it, I think, more extensively later on. But I'll just say that what really makes artificial intelligence, <clears throat> AI, unique is that it is the first technology in history that can make decisions by itself and therefore takes power away from us. We are losing power as humans, as humanity. We are losing power in a way which never happened before. Every previous invention in history, you invent a stone knife or you invent an atom bomb, in essence, it gives humans more power because neither the knife nor the bomb can decide how to use it. A knife cannot decide whether it is used to murder somebody or to save their life in surgery. Similarly, nuclear energy cannot decide by itself whether you use it to build a bomb or to produce electricity. And even if you build a bomb, still the bomb is not so powerful. You are powerful because the bomb can't decide when and where and whether to, 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 uh, to, to blow, to kill people. It's always human decision. AI is different. It can make decisions by itself, not only about how to use it, but increasingly about our own lives. More and more decisions, it's not, it's not the future, it's not science fiction, it's already happening now. Increasingly more and more crucial decisions about our lives. We apply to a bank to get a loan. It's an AI making the decision, not a human being. We apply to university to get a place or a scholarship. Increasingly, it's an AI making the decision. In the global markets, decisions about prices, about buying stocks or commodities, are increasingly made by AI. And what we just saw in the last few months with the uh, appearance of uh, ChatGPT is um, the ability to yeah. tell stories that for all of human history, only humans were able to tell stories. Humans never experience the reality as it is. We always experience reality through a curtain, through a prism, through glasses of, of culture, through texts and music and images. And all through history, the only thing that could create texts and, story and, and, and stories and images and, and music was you, other human beings. And now we have a non-human intelligence that may be better than us at creating this, uh, uh, this curtain, this prism between us and reality. So, you know, the fear of AI is very new in history. It's a couple of decades old. You go back to the middle of the 20th century, you find the first movies and books about AI, the, the dangers of AI. What happens if computers try to take over the world? But the threat of being uh, 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 entrapped by a curtain of illusion that stands between us and reality this is as old as human culture. Humans are always very afraid because they know the power of stories. That, you know, stories uh, um, create nations and also create wars. 
the entire economy is built on stories. Money is just a story. Corporations like Facebook, like Google, they are just stories in our mind. People knew thousands of years ago the power religion. of stories. Yeah, religion. And you have, for instance, in Buddhist tradition, the concept of maya, illusion. And human, the fear of being trapped in maya, trapped in illusion. And we may now be entering the age of maya, the age of illusion. Because we now have a non-human intelligence which is able to kind of place a curtain between, before our eyes, which, you know, I look at the United States today, it's a country which has the best information technology in history, the United States. People can no longer agree who won the last elections. So there are lots of political arguments in human history, in, in American history. It's not new. But despite political arguments in previous decades, Americans, Democrats, Republicans in the 1960s had huge, huge conflicts. They still agreed who won the last elections. No longer. Because, again, there is this curtain of, of, of illusion that descends and separates us from reality. And this is now a danger not to specific individuals or to specific nations. This is now a danger for humanity as a whole. If we are not careful, we will find ourselves entrapped within, uh, behind this curtain of illusion and just lose, lose uh, 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 touch with reality. So we have huge challenges from the yes. technological front, which we'll explore in, in the coming hour and a half. And you would expect that facing these unprecedented, tremendous challenges, humanity will unite. And the exact opposite is happening. Yes, yes. Over the last few years, we have seen a frightening rise in international tension, certainly with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and also with increasing tensions in East Asia, around the South China Sea and Taiwan. And the prospect of a third world war, a new global war, which five years ago seemed unthinkable. People felt, I, per, I felt as a historian, that okay, this was 20th century. We learned our lesson in the 20th century. We won't repeat yeah. the same mistake. No, we are repeating the same mistake. And this time, I mean, we have no margin for, for, for error. In the 20th century, humanity made terrible mistake. Learning how to use the technology of the industrial age and falling into this abyss of, of the world wars. But it didn't destroy us because the technology was not powerful enough yes. to destroy humanity completely. Then when nuclear weapons came, for the first time, humanity had the ability to destroy ourselves, but we were very careful, and the Cold War never erupted into a hot war, at least not on a global level. There were regional conflicts, like in Vietnam, in Korea, in other places, but we avoided the Third World War. Now we are on the verge of it. Yes, and true. with the type of technology that we now command, um, if we fall into it again, this could be the end of, of human civilization. Catastrophe, yes. So these are the three main challenges that we face. And uh, what uh, the, the, the social impact company, Sapienship, that I established with my husband, uh, our mission is simply to focus the conversation on that. Uh, I'll turn to that at the end. Yeah. But thank you very much. I think the opening remarks really covered, uh, you know, all the issues that you speak about in, in, in your three, four books, and, and actually it's already you know, provoking so many thoughts. Uh, Professor uh, Harari, uh, I would like to know, uh, let you know that the questions that I'm going to be asking you today mm -hmm. do not be so selfish. I have had the benefit of conducting a survey mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, getting some questions from the Riggs alumni, the alumni of the institute, about 150 of them, and majority of them had read your books, but I'm sure, like me, most forget, except for <laughs> a few things, and Sapiens in particular, but most of them have, had watched you online. So in the course of my questions, where, 
and I'm definitely going to touch the areas you touched upon. I will try to also, where relevant, you know, in line with the theme of our talk, try and bring your wisdom to bear on, on Bhutan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but otherwise, I think, uh, just get you to share thoughts which can help to make everyone wiser uh, and the world hopefully a better place. So, uh, my first question, happiness. Mm. I'm going to come to all the potential dystopian, utopian futures that you, scenarios that you point about, but I would start, like to start with uh, happiness. Uh, Bhutan's development philosophy and uh, development vision and guiding philosophy is captured by a phrase, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, about it, mm, yeah. gross national happiness. And uh, basically we're talking about development uh, and progress that should enhance the well-being of the people and thus should be holistic, that it should enhance both our living standards as well as our quality of our lives, and that no one should be left behind in the course of development. And, and these very ideas are captured uh, in a very progressive constitution that we enacted for our country in 2008. Mm -hmm. And in your book, uh, Homo Deus, you have identified happiness as one of the three targets for humanity alongside immortality and divinity. Uh, can you elaborate why? And can Bhutan do something on this as a country that can be an example? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, basically almost everything that human beings do, they do it ultimately to liberate themselves from suffering. Um, and, and, and to be happy. I often, in my books, in my talks, I often focus more on suffering than on happiness yes. because it's, it's easier. I mean, there, is, there are a lot of discussions about what happiness is, but suffering, when you suffer, you know it. <laughs> it's, it's easier to grasp, but it's, it's, it's two sides of, of, of the same coin. And everything people do ultimately is for that. I mean, people, again, they, 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 they start entire wars and they fly to the moon, ultimately because they, they want to be happy. And they just don't know how. The big tragedy of humankind for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, is that as a species, of course, individuals are different one from the other. And um, you have individuals, again, like Buddha, which seems that they had a good grasp of what is suffering, where is it coming from, and how to be liberated from it. But um, even Buddha was found it very, very difficult to explain it to his own disciples and to the people who follow him. And, you, and um, certainly when you look at humankind as a whole, as a species, we are extremely good in acquiring power. We have no idea how to translate power into happiness. If you look, again, at tens of thousands of years of history, if you compare us sitting here in this hall in 2023 to people in the Stone Age 40,000, 50,000 years ago, so without question, we are far, far more powerful. Uh, just think at the power at the, at the, at the, in the hands, not of prime ministers and presidents and kings, but of ordinary civilians. Yes. Uh, now, if anybody who has a smartphone has powers which traditionally were thought to be divine abilities, mm -hmm. like you read in ancient mythologies about gods being able to see things that happen now at the other side of the world. Now, anybody with a smartphone can do it. True, so true, yeah. Or a, a god or a goddess can talk to somebody who is in another country right now. That's not special. Anybody can do it now. We can talk with people on the other side of the world. And we have access through this to, again, immense amounts of information and knowledge. Like the average person today has easier access to, to, to global knowledge than the biggest emperors 100 or 200 years ago. We have so much power. And if you think collectively, of course, we can again fly to the moon. We can split the atom. We can read DNA and start to change uh, uh, the, the code of life, to rewrite the code of life. So we have immense power. But then when you look 
at, uh, uh, so if, 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 the, if the, the trajectory of power along history is like this, you look at the trajectory of happiness, you don't see any correspondence increase in either collective or individual happiness. If you look collectively, then humankind is as prone to acts of collective madness in the modern age as in any previous time. You look at movements like, again, not just the world wars, you look at uh, movements like Nazism, like Stalinism in the Soviet Union. So you had the most powerful and advanced societies in, in the world, and they are basically completely insane in how they behave and the amount of misery that they inflict not just on others, but also on themselves. They just had no idea what to do with all their power. And it's, uh, again, also you look at, at the level of individuals. You look at the most powerful people today in the world, they don't seem particularly happy. Like, I don't know, you, look, you watch Putin on, on, on television or on this. He does not strike me as a very happy person. <laughs> like, if I ask myself, okay, who do I go to to learn how to live a better life? I wouldn't go to him. He has, uh, it seems, again, he has all this immense power and forget about the misery he inflicts on Ukrainians and even forget about the misery he inflicts on his own people. He inflicts so much misery on himself. So this is a person who just doesn't know how to convert power into happiness. And again, we don't need to go to these uh, like personalities. Each individual, again, it doesn't seem that the big questions of life that we are able to answer them today any better than we answered them 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I personally think that a person cannot be happy unless you know the truth about yourself, unless you know who you really are, what drives you. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is something that philosophers throughout history that know yourself. This is such an important mm -hmm. thing. And it doesn't seem that the average person today in the most advanced countries like the United States or like China or like Britain, it doesn't seem that they understand themselves any better than a hunter-gatherer 50,000 years ago sure. understood herself or himself. Mm. So something is not working. Can Bhutan it's, do something? Can Bhutan? That's yeah. the question. I hope so. Again, I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm not an expert on Bhutan. Are we looking for that kind of a happy story that mm -hmm. could capture everyone's imagination and I think, again, help big people become more sensible? That just the fact that a government uh, uh, places happiness as a main national target, this in itself is a very important uh, a step and hopefully also gives inspiration to, to other governments and to other organizations to follow suit. Because, um, again, if, if you don't, uh, if you're not clear about the goal, you'll never get there. Exactly. Yeah. Of course, being clear about the goal also doesn't guarantee you, you get there. True. <laughs> but it, it's the first step. Thank you. Uh, Professor Harari, culture. You know, Bhutan is a country very rich in culture and traditions. You've been here a couple of days. You must have seen it. Yeah. Clothes we wear, architecture, mm -hmm. our social etiquette. And I, I don't know if you're aware, we have held on to this even as we modernize. And our modernization is relatively recent. First motorable roads in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So, so our culture and tradition, it has been a source of our values, our identity, it imbues uh, things we do with meaning. What is likely to be the impact of the technological disruption on culture and traditions of smaller countries and communities? Hmm. Yeah, we see all over the world this tension between uh, the need and the desire to, to modernize, and the need and the desire to preserve tradition. And um, in both cases, we need to be wise. We, we shouldn't modernize uh, blindly, just adopting the latest technology just because it's there. And similarly, we shouldn't preserve traditions just because they are there. The fact that something is old doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Uh, every tradition was once new. 
Every tradition. Absolutely. Yeah. So every tradition, when you trace it to the beginning, you find somebody who said, who said for the first time, let's wear this kind of clothes, or let's do this kind of, of ritual, and everybody says, no, 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 no. This is not the, the, the way we do, we do it in the past. And they managed to convince them, like, no, let's do it like this. And then after a couple of generations, then it becomes tradition. But every tradition was once new. And again, human beings, as we know them today, all the nations, all the cultures, it's very, very new. Because if you look, the oldest religions today, the oldest nations, um, they go back maybe 5,000 years. Maximum. Now, 5,000 years, when you think about it in terms of our own life, it's, it sounds a long time. If you think about it in terms of, you know, political events, oh, it's such a long time, 5,000 years. We can barely think in five days. But if you look at the real span of history, it's such a short time. Yes. Humans have been on the planet for more than two million years. The planet itself is four billion years. Four when billion. I think about what is really tradition, what is really, really deep tradition. So I think, for example, about breathing. That we're breathing, we breathe out. You know, we do it all the time, otherwise we don't, we don't live. Uh, it connects us to all other living beings. True. Elephants also breathe and fish breathe, everybody breathe. There is something very deep in it. Because, you know, you take something from the world, you give back something to the world. You take something from the world, you give back. And it's no coincidence that it, oh yeah, in many meditation traditions, you start with breathing. It's the first thing you learn about yourself is that I'm breathing. Mm. Which sounds ridiculous, everybody knows they are breathing, but no, like when you start meditating, you realize how little you know about this thing of breathing. And this is kind of the oldest tradition. And I think about religion in Israel. So Judaism, which many people say, oh, this is a very old religion. So again, Judaism is maybe 3,000 years old. In terms of generations, it's a hundred generations. If I think about the key Jewish tra tradition, so tomorrow we have the Passover celebration, one of the most important rituals in the Jewish calendar, where all the family gathers to commemorate uh, how the Jews came out of slavery in Egypt. And um, people say this connects us to the previous generations. And it's just a hundred generations at most. When I breathe, it connects me to hundreds of millions generations of breathing entities that came before me. This is such a deep thing. And again, it's, you look at, at our basic emotions, love, hate, anger, whatever you feel, your breath changes. Like you fall in love, your breath immediately changes. Yes. You become angry with somebody, your breath changes. Yes, faster. So, our deepest emotions, you don't understand them by looking at, again, Jewish tradition of a hundred generations. You want to understand love and hate, you need to think in terms of millions of years. And what is real strikes me about technology is that it threatens even that. That we are now creating new entities, again, like AI, AI doesn't breathe. Mm. Of course. But when I think about my relation with AI or with new types of, of, of beings that might come to dominate the planet, so one of the things I think about, hey, this is not a breathing entity. So after millions of years, hundreds of millions of years of, of the tradition of breathing, here is something that doesn't breathe. What is the impact on how it understands the world. On the, again, we mentioned earlier that, that now AI can create stories, can create mythologies, oh, yes. can create religions. Like, I think that in a couple of years, we will see religions whose scriptures, that the holy texts, are written by AI. Now, how does a religion look like when its holy text is written by a non-breathing entity? Fascinating. Well, actually, I'm going to turn to that, uh, the biotech and infotech that you talk about. And in fact, uh, from your books, what we can see that is clearly that three, three issues keep you awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> the possibility of a nuclear war that you spoke about, 
climate change and technological disruption. And of course, the first two are well known, but technological disruption is the one that perplexes us, I think most of us, the most. And this is also an area that His Majesty the King speak, uh, speaks about quite passionately and indeed even in the National Day Address to the nation, so that uh, with the concern that Bhutan must not get left behind with the yeah. advancements of technology. So in this respect, uh, you earlier mentioned that technology is literally like a tool, uh, like a knife that can be used as a scalpel to perform surgery or save, and save lives or, or as a murder weapon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your opinion, what is likely to be the biggest benefit from the technological revolution? And also what is likely to be the main downside and how can small countries like Bhutan be better prepared for it? Hmm. You know, um, again, it, it, we can use it in so many different ways. So the worst outcome is simple, the complete annihilation of humanity. <laughs> that, that, that's a step easy. before that. A step before what that, would be a, big concern? a dystopia is a situation when uh, AI and other and new technological tools are monopolized by a very few powerful countries. We saw it before in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, you know, with steam engines and trains and electricity and all that. So you had a, free, a few countries like Britain and France and later the United States, Japan. They were the industrial powers and they used their power to basically conquer and exploit the whole world. Yes. So you think this small island on the, con on, on, on the edge of Europe, how did it come to, to rule India? And, and most of, much of Asia and Africa are because of the power of industrialization. And the new technologies we develop now, like AI, they are much more powerful than steam engines and railroads and electricity and, and these kinds of things. Um, so... If, again, a few countries lead the world in the AI revolution, they will be in a position to conquer and exploit everybody else. And this time, the type of control they will have could be uh, much tighter and stronger than what we saw in the previous imperial age. Because one other thing that really concerns me about AI is that it makes it possible for the first time to uh, uh, survey, to monitor everybody all the time. Surveillance. Surveillance, and monitor even what's happening inside their body. Yes. Like you think about dictators in history and emperors in history. I don't know, people like Stalin or Mao or Hitler. They always wanted to follow everybody all the time, to know what each citizen is doing and, and even thinking and feeling, but they couldn't do it because it was impossible, technically. Like if you're Stalin in the Soviet Union, you have 200 million citizens in the Soviet Union, you don't have 200 million KGB agents that every person, you put a KGB agent, follow that person every 24 hours a day, tell me what he's doing. They don't have enough agents. And even if they have enough agents, uh, what does the agent do? Like, say there is a KGB agent following me 24 hours a day. Never sleeps, just follows me. Everything I do, he sees. He, in the end of the day, he needs to write a paper report. He went there, he met this person, he said that, and send this paper report to Moscow, to headquarters, where they get every day a mountain of paper from all over the Soviet Union, 200 million paper reports. Somebody needs to read all that, analyze it, Make sense of it. Nobody can do that. They don't have the analysts. So even Stalin in the Soviet Union could not follow everybody all the time. So people had some measure of privacy, some measure of little space of freedom. Now with technology, it can be done. You don't need human agents to follow you around. You have electronic agents. You have digital agents. We carry the agents in our own pockets. Our smart, we pay for them even, like our smartphones and all, and all these cameras and all these microphones, they follow us 24 hours a day. They don't need to write a paper report at the end of the day, he went there, he met this person. No, they send all the, all the information to, not to Moscow, to the cloud. 
And in the cloud, you have the new AI tools. You don't need human analysts to read and analyze all that. You have AI tools, algorithms, that can analyze all this ocean of information. And as I mentioned, it can even enter inside our own bodies. Not just what we, where we go and who we meet, but even how we feel and what we think. They can, might even reach that level. So we could be facing the worst totalitarian regimes in history that will be far more extreme than anything we saw in the 20th century. And what can we do against uh, to there are many avoid things. that? There are many th First of all, again, this is just a dystopian scenario. There are also very positive scenarios. Yes. We can use all this technology not in order to create this immense gap between a few imperial powers of a very small elite that controls everybody, but to use all this to benefit everybody. So, for instance, to easily provide the basic necessities for all human beings. There is a lot of discussion you know, about the job market. What happens when automation makes, for instance, the production of textiles uh, are cheaper to produce yes. textiles yeah. automatically than to use textile workers? What would the textile workers do? Ideally, ideally if, if, if we do it right, we don't need to protect the jobs, we need to protect the people. Yes. I mean, um, it's not necessarily the best thing for a human being to spend eight or ten hours every day just making textile if they don't want to. If we can provide them the basic necessities of life and they can invest their time in building communities, mm. in taking care of family, in developing spirituality, in developing art or sport, mm. most people would prefer this type of future. Mm. And we can do that if we harness the immense power of the new technology for the benefit of everybody mm -hmm. and not for the benefit of only a very small number of or, or countries or, or, or a very small number of people in the country. Yes. Uh, and it's the same with surveillance. Mm. I mean, you can use surveillance for the, a, a, a one big dictator to spy on everybody. You can also use surveillance, for instance, to make sure there is no government corruption or to make sure that corporations pay their taxes. Mm, yes. It's, it's, it's a choice of what you do with the technology. And we need to regulate these technologies. So there are two main things. One is to make sure that you don't get just a few countries or corporations monopolizing these mm -hmm. immensely yes. powerful technologies. Global. That's one key goal. And here we need cooperation. And Global. of course, a small country like Bhutan cannot uh, stand up to a big country like China or the United States by itself, or to a big corporation like Google or Tencent or Baidu by itself. But if you unite with a lot of other countries, then as a block, uh, you can try to regulate uh, these emerging technologies. The other thing is, again, to implement, there is a long list of, 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 of ideas. I'll just give one or two, just to, to, to uh, um, uh, give it examples. Yes. So, for instance, we already have very strict laws about how uh, 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 people who give a service, what they can or, and cannot do with the information they have on us. Like if I go to my personal physician, I have some disease, some medical condition, uh, I get to get treatment. So I tell my physician very private things about me. Yes. that maybe even my family doesn't know, my neighbors don't know, and there is this thing called fiduciary uh, uh, obligation of the physician to use this very private information only in order to help me. Mm. They are not allowed to use it for anything else. With physician, with lawyers, with accountants, we have this, it's obvious. Mm. My doctor cannot take my information and sell it to some corporation to use against me. That's, that's a crime. But the big tech companies, they do it all the time. There we don't have this simple law. We need a global yeah, cooperation. That if, if, you, if you, you cannot take my private information and just sell it to a third party uh, to make money without my consent, but in, 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 in like, uh, uh, with the big tech, this is how it, it, it happens. It's the business model. It's the business model. Yes. And this is something that governments should say, no, you can't do that, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's illegal. And, and similarly, 
um, we should have regulations that prevent the over-concentration of too much information in one place. Whether it's a corporation, whether it's a government agency, when there is too much information concentrated in one place, it always, always leads to, to a dictatorship. Digital dictatorship. Di digital dictatorship. So like this, the, 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 you know, there are entire organizations mm. these are good guys. and think tanks yeah. that are working on these regulations. Mm. But as we talked earlier, the problem is that just to understand, just for politicians and lawmakers and citizens, to understand what is happening is difficult. And without understanding what is ha happening, it's difficult to regulate it. Yes, the yes. people who best understand what is happening, they don't go to politics. Yes. They True. go to business. To, to, to make. <laughs> Professor Harari, that's why we need uh, storytellers like you, very yeah. compelling storytellers. And I wanted to pick up on that one thing you mentioned, yeah. that there's going to be this large uh, loss of jobs because you know self-driving cars, so on and so forth, with uh, the technological disruption. Yeah. And that's where you promote this idea of a UBI. But UBI, a lot of people think uh, instinctively universal basic income, national. But you're actually talking about international. And yeah. I was thinking this is obviously of interest to countries like us. Could you expound a little further? Yeah, a lot of people who do think about the problem of automation, what people do to, to the job market, one of the ideas you get often, you get uh, 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 people talking about is UBI, universal basic income. The idea is that uh, government uh, uh, taxes the big corporations who make money out of, or make lots of profits from automation and uses the proceeds to give basic income or basic services, services. to the people who lost their jobs. Now, this could work in some cases, but there are big problems with it. One big problem is that people who talk about it, they think in national terms. They think in terms of the you know, US government uh, taking taxes from big corporations in California in order to give uh, uh, basic income to unemployed taxi drivers or coal miners in Pennsylvania. But the biggest problems will be on the international level because there will be a lot of new jobs in the new economy the real question will be how to retrain people mm. for the new jobs. Now, a country like the United States, which is already a rich country and will become even richer because of the automation revolution, it will be in a very good position to educate and retrain its workforce so it will be even more successful. Um, it will be able to fill all, all the new jobs in the new economy. Other countries which are already behind, they are likely to be hit very hard by the automation revolution mm. because if they make, say, uh, like Bangladesh, making m much of its uh, economy depends on the textile industry, what happens to Bangladesh once it's cheaper to produce textiles in the US than in Bangladesh? And then, okay, we need to retrain the workforce. But where do you get the money? I mean, retraining the workforce is very, very costly. You have people who are out of jobs, you have to support them during the training course, which can last months, maybe years. You need teachers, you need facilities. I mean, where do you get the money to do all that? The danger is that some countries, if we don't tackle it on the international level, some countries will become extremely powerful and wealthy because of the automation revolution. Other countries will completely collapse. So we need a global safety net yes. to make sure that the poorer countries are not left completely behind. You know, in the 20th century, the idea, the basic economic idea was if you're in a developing country, and let's say you don't have oil or some other such resource, so your main resource is uh, manual labor. You start industries like textile, which don't require too much, you know, like very professional education, and you gradually develop from there. You use the money you make from textile to, to move on to uh, uh, electronics and move on from there. But in the 21st century, it's like somebody came and just chopped off the bottom half of the ladder, like the ladder that countries use to climb. So the bottom half, which relies mainly on cheap manual labor, it's yes. being cut. So how would the developing countries, what, how can they 
develop, mm. that's a very big question we need to tackle yeah, in the true. 21st century. And worse still, you mentioned that some of them may be beyond remedy, and that's where the useless class, and yeah. that's, that's another complication. That's if, if and that's we, where I think the UBI is going to be critical. If, uh, it's, if it's on a global level, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's the only way to make it work, I think. Well, uh, Prof, uh, Professor Hara, returning now to the field of education, mm -hmm. and in light of now we're exper experiencing artificial intelligence, chat, chat GPT, and all that to come. So how should we prepare our children? And in your books, you emphasize gener general purpose skills. Yeah. So I was wondering, could you expound further? what the new yeah, we form are facing of education should be? In education, like in other fields, we face an unprecedented situation that we now need to educate young people without having any idea of the kind of world that they will inhabit when they are adults. Throughout history, of course, you could never predict the future. Like you go back a thousand years, you don't know what will happen in 20 years. There are so many political events that can happen. Uh, somebody can invade the country. There could be a civil war. Maybe there is an epidemic. Maybe there is an earthquake. So many things you can't predict. But the basic skills of life, they don't change very quickly. So a thousand years ago, you know, it doesn't matter what happens on the political level. People will still need to know how to plant rice or wheat, how to bake bread, how to build a house, how to ride a horse, how to read and write. Basic skills. So you know this is good to, to teach the young people how to do these things. Now, we have no idea what the world would look like in 20 years. We have no idea what the job market will be, except that it will be very different from what it is now. There will be new jobs. We just don't know what these new, new jobs will be. Uh, you know, like in recent years, lots of people said the best bet is to teach young people how to code, how to write computer code, because we don't know how the world would look like in 20 years, but we are sure they'll need a lot of coders. Now, AI is becoming able to code. So may, all bets are off. Maybe we don't need human coders in 20 years because this is something that AI can do by itself. You just give it, oh, I want to uh, this or that, that kind of application, write me the code and it writes the code. So we don't know the type of skills that will be necessary. Um, and the first field that encounters this problem is education. Because in business, let's say I have a, 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 some company today I don't need to worry so much about what will be in 20 years. I worry about the next few months, or maybe one or two years. 20 years is very distant. But in education, 20 years is not distant. If you now teach kids who are like six or seven years old, 20 years is, is the name of the game. I mean, what do I teach a six-year-old today so that she or he will have the necessary skill in 20 years? That, that's, that's the whole point. And we don't know the answer. We do know that the world will be extremely hectic, fluid. Things will change Constant. very, very rapidly. Not only in the economy, even our bodies will change in ways which were previously unthinkable. With the new technologies, with biotechnology, with, again, connecting brains and computers, there will be major changes even to the body. So the, what people will need is the ability to keep changing and keep learning throughout their lives. They will have to constantly learn new skills. They will have to constantly reinvent themselves. Um, and for this, they will need a lot of mental resilience and, and, and emotional flexibility. It's very difficult to change. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. young people don't find it easy to change. Yes. And the older you get, the harder it gets. Harder, yes. Like, by the time you're 40 or 50, you don't want to change. Old dogs don't learn new yeah. tricks. Yeah. And, um, but this will be essential. So, so how do you build a new type of, of, of human... Learning how to learn. That is able to keep learning and changing. And here, again, I think that the emphasis should be on psychological, mental, emotional skills. Okay, thank you.
No, that's a lot to unpack. Uh, let me turn to that, actually. Yeah. Uh, you talk about this idea of hacking humans, and it is in that context you mentioned, know thyself, and that's the way to retain some control and not cede all authority to the algor algorithms. Yes. But then you raise this most uh, troubling aspect about free will. Mm. We all like to believe that we are the masters of our own destiny, and uh, uh, with free will and that with education and now the internet, that this is even more so. This is what we like to believe. But you paint a very different picture, and uh, uh, in fact, the picture you paint challenges the whole notion of free will as commonly understood. Yeah. So let me quote you. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Harari, you write that if free will is freedom to do what you desire, you humans have free will, but if free will means the freedom to choose what you desire, then we don't have free will. Please explain. Uh, yes, I mean, <laughs> it's, when people hear we have no free will, they say, but I feel that I'm yes. doing what I want. Yes. And yes, this, obviously this is true. And this is true of humans, this is true of chimpanzees, this is true of elephants, this is true of rat, rats. Rat, a rat wants to run something somewhere, she or he feels, yes, I want to run there, I run there. If this is what is meant by free will, there is no, no, no argument. But the idea that I can choose my own desires, I can like I have freedom over my will, I can tell myself, now you want this. No, 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 now you want that. It doesn't work. From our own experience, we know that uh, uh, what we like to eat, uh, the people we like, uh, sexual attraction, we have no control over it, or very, very little control over it. My main issue is with the, the, the idea of free will. It makes people uncurious about themselves. Like, one of the biggest questions in life is what is the source of my desires? What is the source of my decisions? Why do I want these things? Why did I make this decision? Now, if you believe in free will, it makes you lose curiosity. Why did I chose this? Because this is my free will. End of story. There is nothing to investigate. If you don't believe in free will, or, or you are willing to kind of withhold judgment, I don't know. Let's investigate what really caused me to desire this particular thing. Then you start investigating. And when you start investigating, you realize that there are so many things that manipulate my desires. Yeah. Other people manipulate my desires. Uh, 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 religious and cultural ideas influence my desires. Um, things that happen within my body influence my desires. Like as we study in depth the human body, the human brain, the DNA, we realize so many biological processes that we know nothing about. Like 99% of the processes in your body happen without our understanding and knowledge. As you are now sitting listening to me, so many things happen in your brain, in your body, that you have no, no idea that they are happening. So we know very little about what really shapes our emotions, our feelings, our desires. If you make, and, and, and again, the key to that is to realize, maybe I'm, I don't know why I, why I made this decision. Let's investigate. But let's investigate. If after a long investigation, you find that there is some type of freedom in yourself, then okay. If that is the result of your investigation, then fine. But it should not be taken as a kind of uh, 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 presupposition, I made these decisions because I have free will. That I think that real freedom for humans is not something they have, it's something they have to struggle for. Yes, you make that point in the book. That if you, if you made, if you, you have to, to struggle for, for your whole life, and then maybe you have some real freedom. And often real freedom is not the freedom to exercise your will or to choose your will. It's the freedom from your will. That, okay, I want this, it, but it doesn't, this desire doesn't necessarily control my life. And this is something that needs a lot of, of work yes. to, to do. True, true. Uh, professor, I think it's slightly related. Um, this is my personal pet peeve. Hmm. And uh, my personal pet peeve is uh, 
the fact that in our schools we teach our children everything, but we don't teach them the most important thing, uh, which is thinking, mm. which is so critical, like what you just mentioned, in making good choices. And in this regard, I wanted to draw upon one of the teachings of the Buddha. This is a little long, please indulge me. Uh, one of the teachings as a framework that can be used to enhance thinking so that you improve the choices you make and thereby assert whatever free will is possible as a human being. And when I say I'm uh, taking recourse to the uh, Buddha's teaching, I'm talking about a particular teaching where he speaks about the five parts of, of the mind. Uh, you might recall this from the Vipassana discourse, mm -hmm. uh, where he says that everything we human beings experience, our existence, we experience through consciousness, yes. through the sense doors of sight, sound, mm -hmm. uh, sight, sound, taste, touch, etc. Et and that this, through the sense doors, consciousness is triggered, and that in turn triggers perception or thoughts in our mind that these thoughts are what drives our sensations or feelings, which lead to our action. You're angry, you shout, whatever. Mm -hmm. And those actions lead to result. Yeah. And that in this chain, that thinking is optional and it's up to you, which is why same facts, you can have different perspectives. Yes. What do you think? Yeah, um, the mind is actually yeah, it is really like a factory, which is constantly working, at least when we are awake, constantly producing thoughts and interpretations and stories about the world. And like we said earlier, very often, and we don't really experience reality. We experience all these stories and interpretations. And this makes the mind a very, very critical place. Um, because again, most of the conflicts in the world, for instance, they are not about objective things like food or like territory. They are about the thoughts in the mind, about the stories that our own mind produce. Yes. Like I think about my own country. So in Israel, we have a very long conflict with the Palestinians. And many people think this is a conflict about territory. That, uh, 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 you know, like chimpanzees or wolves, they fight over territory. So also human beings fight over territory. But this is not the case. There is no objective lack of territory, of just ground, place to build houses and schools and hospitals. There is enough territory. There is also enough food. It's not like there is not enough food, so people are fighting over the last piece of bread who, who will get it. There is enough food. They have conflicting stories in their minds, conflicting thoughts, and because of that, there is a war. The war is about something in the mind, not about something in the outside world. Like uh, you go to Jerusalem, like the most holy city, that both sides wants it. So I, I, I still teach at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, so I'm, I'm, every week I'm there. And it's a completely ordinary place. It's a completely ordinary place, like any other place in the world. You have stones, you have trees, you have dogs, you have birds, it's, you have humans, it's like any other place. But in their minds, people create a story about the place. And they imagine that this place is full of gods and angels and, and holiness. And instead of this holiness making them peaceful and compassionate, it makes them hateful and angry because they all want to have this holy place to themselves. They don't fight about the stones. Nobody cares about the stones. They fight about the story that they hold in their mind about, oh, this is the holy stone, I must have it. You can't have it, this is mine. And the real tragedy about it, I think, is that again, I mean, the meaning of a holy place, I think in most traditions, is that this is a place that brings peacefulness to your mind and brings compassion to your relations with others. So if you have a so-called holy place which creates uh, discord and violence and hatred, it's obviously a dysfunctional holy place. 
Like you have a factory for cars, and instead of producing cars, it produces broken cars. So who wants such a factory? But still, again, people fight over it. And it all comes from the mind. So this is, again, like also in Buddhist tradition, that Buddha said that mind matters most. Mind mm. comes first. Yes. If we could clear our minds, there would be no wars in the world. Because the wars are not really, it's, they are never about the territory. Again, you look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's not about territory. If it was about territory, Russia is the largest country in the world. It has more territories than anybody else. It doesn't need more territory. But it has a story. Putin has a story in the mind. And because of the story in his mind, there is this terrible war. So we need to invest a lot of effort in cleaning our minds. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me turn to consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I raised this is you mentioned that in the AI revolution, AI has intelligence but no consciousness. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure. I mean, it depends what we do with it or what do it do does with us. Um, intelligence and consciousness are, are, are uh, uh, concepts that people often mix together because in human beings, they are mixed together. Intelligence is the ability to solve problems, any kind of type of problems. How to navigate the room, how to cure cancer, that's intelligence, solving problems. Consciousness is the ability to feel things like pain or pleasure or, or joy or anger. Now humans and also other mammals, also chimpanzees, also elephants, also pigs, they solve problems through their feelings. Um, and we see it in cases, in rare cases, when, when people have, uh, uh, like, they, they shut down their emotional part, they also find it very difficult to solve any problems. Now, AI works in a very different way. As far as we know, AI has no feelings at all. It never feels anything, no pain, no pleasure, no joy, no anger. But it has very high intelligence, at least in certain fields. Um, and in, in certain fields, it's more intelligent than us. Mm -hmm. Like in certain games, like chess, we already know it. No human being can beat a computer at chess. So what happens if the world is increasingly dominated by entities, by beings, who are more intelligent than us, but they have no feelings? They are never sad, they are never joyful, they don't have hatred, they don't have love. We don't know. Because we don't know, again, it goes back to the breathing that we talked about earlier. Also, we are not familiar with any animals that don't have feelings. Like all the animals we interact with, with are like us. They have feelings. Yeah. So um, one of the biggest questions about the future is, is what happens when increasingly the world is dominated by these super intelligent but non-conscious beings. And... I think that the, 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 the first thing is to slow down. Because we don't understand mm. the consequences of, of such a new power taking over the world, the safest thing is to slow down and wait until we understand it better. Mm. You know, like uh, 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 drug companies producing a new medicine, they can't just release the medicine mm. to the public before they go through a long process, can take many years of testing this medicine, making sure they understand it, making sure it's safe. Mm. But tech companies, they create now things which are much more powerful than medicines, these new AI tools, and they just release them to the public sphere without any understanding of what the consequences will be. So I think the first oh, step true. is to slow down. No, you can't do that. You have to first check for safety, then mm. see if we can release it to the public. Like, like what the Luddites did. You have to be a little measured, I guess. Yeah, it's not stopping yes, but the stop. development. It's yeah. not kind of completely giving up technology. No, up, 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 but just do it a bit more mm. slowly and more carefully. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Harari. I think it was so engrossing that I lost track of time. 
I think we have uh, kept some time for audience interaction. And as you are aware, we have in the audience honorable prime ministers, uh, dignitaries and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. So the floor is open for questions. Please raise your hand and we will pass the mic around. Right at the back. Uh, with this slide. Hello. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dashukarma. My name is Sonam. I used to work with Dashukarma. Uh, I'm going to ask a question on artificial intelligence taking cue from the kind of an evolutionary perspective that you provided, perhaps AI starting almost like a single-celled organism that certainly develops into a complicated, uh, complex organism that we lose control of. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me qualify my remark, my question, by contextualizing it. In Bhutan, we have been talking about AI at the level of institutions, officers, but as a part of a national discourse, it has become possible thanks to His Majesty the King, who invoked, who drew our attention to the potential and possibilities of AI. We recognize that it's complex. We recognize that it's fast evolving, but we had an optimistic perspective about it, how to regulate life, society, use it for governance, to solve problems. And I think you also drew our attention towards the later part of your uh, talk of how we take advantage of emerging technologies, uh, use it to better human conditions. But you began with a totally new perspective. AI as a non-breathing entity that could write holy texts, create a god for us. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the specter of a totalitarian regime that's without heart or feelings. So then someone like me, how I understand is that you paint this almost like an evolutionary process, but at some point of time in the process, human lose control. Mm. That it delinks and that it is no longer artificial intelligence, that it is almost like an alien intelligence that is either in competition with yeah. or superior to human intelligence. So my question is, at what point of time do humans lose this control? And if this question, mm -hmm. and actually, in, because this is not so archaic, it's not so ancient, so at what point of time did humans begin to have a sense of this loss of control over technology, mm -hmm. that we saw technology not as an enabler, but as a disrupting force? Mm -hmm. And if this question were even valid, as a historian, as a scholar, yeah. How do we as human, as society, as communities, as government, start to deal with that before we lose control, mm. that AI serve humanity and humanity does not become servile to AI? Thank you. Last. Did you get so, that? I mean, the fear about losing control to our own creations is, is very old. We, we, we see it in most mythologies. We see it in, certainly in modern literature and art going back, say, to Frankenstein by Mary Shelley in the early 19th century. So this fear is, is old. What is new is that AI is the first tool that the danger there is real because it's the first tool that can really take power away from us. A knife couldn't do it. An atom bomb couldn't do it because it couldn't make decisions. They always needed us to make the decisions. Now there is something that can make decisions instead of us. So the danger is real. When do we cross the, the, the point? It's not a single point in time. It's a process, but it's a very rapid process, and we are already in the middle of it. We are already losing power. We are already losing control. Uh, and most people don't understand what is happening. They don't understand how AI works, how social media works. And now the idea like you have in science fiction, that you have a computer trying to take over the world, so let's pull the plug. And pull the plug on the computer so it doesn't take control. How do you pull the plug on social media? It's not a single computer. It's on every computer. And now our economy, our social life, our politics depends on it. Who wins or loses elections increasingly depends on social media. So how can politicians pull the plug on social media when they depend on it? And um, social media was very primitive AI. There is AI in social media. 
In social media, the content is produced by human beings. AI, very primitive AI, is used only in order to curate the content to decide what to show each person. Like you have a TikTok account, so there is an AI that decides what videos to show you. You have a Facebook account, the same thing. And even though it was very primitive, it was enough to completely disrupt human society. Because, again, this AI was given the task of maximizing engagement, of gaining the attention, more and more attention of people. If previously, last year, people spent 50 minutes on our platform, the task given to the AI make people spend 60 minutes on our platform this year. And the AI discovered how to do it. By trial and error, it discovered, nobody gave it the order, it discovered by itself that the way to grab people's attention is to press the hate button in their brain, to press the fear button, to press the anger button. You want to grab people's attention, you make them angry about something. Now, AI didn't intend for wars to erupt, or for ethnic cleansing to happen, or for democracies to collapse. It had a very simple goal, just increasing a, 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 the time you spend on the platform. But this was the byproduct, that by spreading all this hate and fear and anger, the result was political chaos in many places. And this is very primitive AI. And in this sense, we already lost control. But it's not human beings who decided that this will happen. It's an algorithm that unconsciously made this decision. And again, what we are seeing in the last few months and weeks with ChatGPT and GPT-4 and the new generation, it goes much, much further and much more rapidly. Uh, we still, it's not too late. We still have agency, we still have power. If the governments of the world, if the big corporations of the world will decide, slow down, they can still do it. Yes. But for how many more years? We don't know. The next election in the US, for instance, in November 2024, is likely to be run to a large extent by AI. That the AI will even mm. produce, again, the political speeches, the propaganda in the, in, 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 in the networks, will no longer be produced by human beings, but by AI. Mm. And we are not prepared to, to how to deal with it. True, true. I think there must be some linkage to the bot bottom line in terms of the rationalizing the algorithm is doing to press all the right buttons for yeah. all the wrong reasons. Again, the, the bottom line, it was human beings gave yeah. the, the initial task. Yes. Human beings told the algorithm, increase uh, 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 the time people spend on our platform. This was a human command. True, true. But then the discovery that the way to do it is by spreading, say, videos that, that create anger and hatred. This was a discovery of AI. Some people think that it's, a, it's an intentional conspiracy of the big corporations. From what I know, no, nobody, in, no human being at the top of the big corporations intentionally decided, let's spread hatred. Let's uh, uh, bring down democracies. Let's uh, create wars. There was no human decision. It was an AI decision. Yeah, it is. Last, we'll take some more questions. Uh, My name is Karma. I want to hear from you your opinion on three issues. Three. Uh, three, yes. <laughs> In any order you want. First, first, we experience a lot of polarization these days, starting in the West. Does that mean there's a reversal of the globalization? Polarization. In your view, that's question number one. Question number two, the society, you are a historian and you believe in historical changes, you study change. That being so, at one point does a nation or a society reinvent itself or reimagine itself? Mm -hmm. Number three, in your book you say you meditate. You meditate for two hours or so. Why? <laughs> Last, thank you, La. Okay, so uh, let's try to do it quick. I tend to give long answers. Yes. I, tr I try to do it quick. Globalization, it depends what we mean by it. Some people mean narrow globalization, which is only economic, the level of trade between countries, and this is certainly going in reverse. 
But at a deeper level, globalization simply means the connection between different parts of the globe. War is also a form of globalization. The Second World War, for instance, was one of the high points, or the extreme points of globalization, when, when people from different parts of the world meet to kill each other. This is also a connection. We are very often influenced by our enemies more than by anybody else. We constantly study them. We try to, 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 uh, to, to do something against what they do. Very strong connection. A thousand years ago, there was no connection at all between, say, America and China or America and Russia. So conflict is also a form of globalization. The opposite of globalization is not conflict. The opposite of globalization is ignorance, that just countries have no, con has no, no knowledge of each other. And we are going, I think, towards greater uh, globalization, not necessarily economic, other types about countries, nations reinventing themselves, it happens all the time. One of the things, again, about human traditions, every tradition was at one point a new thing. Yes. And very often when people invent a tradition, they claim it's very ancient. So you see all over the world that now countries are inventing traditions for themselves, which are completely new, but they claim to be very, very old. This is what is known often as a fundamentalist revolution. Fundament is the basis. Um, especially in religious sphere, people are almost never willing to admit that what they do is new. So they do something new and claim it's very old. It's a very, very common trick in religious history to do something unprecedented, never heard of, and claim it's very old. How do you do it? You say that the, like the previous few generations were bad, they lost some kind of very ancient tradition, and you now, you don't create a new tradition, you discover a very old tradition that was forgotten. So this is very common, it happened throughout history, it also happens now. Our third question about meditation, I, I, I meditate basically, again, what I spoke earlier, to, to clean my mind that uh, the, the, the mind constantly produces these stories, these illusions, these fictions. And um, I can't understand the world because of, of, of this curtain of illusion. And meditation, for me, I know that different people meditate for different reasons, but for me, meditation is a way to lift this curtain of illusion and get in touch with reality. Because the basic question for me in meditation is what is, re what is really happening? As you can, you start with the simplest exercise of observing your breath coming in and out of your nostrils. So this is really happening. It's very difficult to, to feel it, to focus on it. You try to, f to feel the breath coming in and out. This is reality. And within five seconds, some memory comes in your mind or some fantasy comes in your mind, and you start rolling in this fantasy for 10 minutes until you finally realize, hey, I was supposed to observe my breath. So this is how I train my mind to stay in touch with reality. If I can't observe my own breath without being overwhelmed by fantasies from my mind, I will not be able to understand AI or the economic system or the global political situation without being overwhelmed by some fiction or some fantasy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. There's a question on Slido that we've been taking. This mm -hmm. as the largest number of votes. So let me read it to you. Uh, basically, it's asking, what is your view on extended focus on STEM education? Extended? Focus on oh. STEM mm -hmm. education. I think STEM is, is very important, but it shouldn't be the only thing that, that we teach. I think it should be balanced with, again, training people to have this kind of mental flexibility. Mental uh, you know, even basic things like how to deal with failure in life, mm. how to build good relationships in life. It's amazing, you know, that kids can go through 12 years of school and learn mathematics and learn physics and learn history and never get any skills 
for how to build a relationship. And how can you be happy in life if you don't have good relationships? So you can be Nobel Prize winner in physics and you can be whatever you want and you, you don't know how to build human relationships, you won't be happy. Mm. So it, it has to be uh, uh, balanced. And also with all the, uh, everything we talked about, AI and, yes. and these things, um, the, the best chance we have to deal with AI, AI is developing at an enormous speed. It's nowhere near its full potential. But the mind, the human mind, also is nowhere near its full potential. Uh, to know how to deal with AI, we need mathematics and we need to, uh, computer science to understand AI, but we also need to develop our own minds. So I think that for every dollar and every hour we spend on developing AI, we also need to develop and an, 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 to, de to invest a dollar and an hour in developing our own minds so we know what to do with the AI. Makes so much sense. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, any question? Show of hand? Maybe we have... Yes, please. May the lady in red. Yeah. Yes. Mike. Mike, please. Uh, good evening, Professor. Thank you very much for enlightening us uh, throughout various topics. Um, my name is Pritika. I'm a faculty at Royal Temple College. Uh, my question is related to your uh, perspective of the imagined order, where you have, to, uh, you have uh, mentioned it that people get influenced with stories. We have this boundary, a thin um, border between the uh, reality and the stories that we are being told mm -hmm. and uh, one of the easiest means of influencing people is of course the religion and um, there are so many religions who have predicted um, the endless epidemic and also the AI the advancement of technology um, people being monitored using the chip which um, also connects to the idea of one policy one world so um, I just wanted to know your perspective on that uh, idea of one policy, one world. Thank I, I'm, you. I'm not sure I'm familiar with the, what, what is the meaning of one policy, one world. Um, so basically there are various religions who uh, talk about how uh, because of the advancement of technology, people also ha can um, use chips in the body where, you know, even to go to a grocery store, I don't have to ha carry my wallets or I don't have to have um, like... Uh, mobiles even to mm. connect oh, to people okay. i just pay and then that in some way it connects the entire world and so it kind of makes mm. one ruler one policy one world yeah. so that was like, uh, thank so, you uh, first of all i think that the technology is not there yet mm. that uh, i know that a lot of people in many places are worried about uh, corporations or governments implanting them with chips in the brains or in the body and controlling them and I also worry about this possibility in the long term, like in 50 years or 100 years. But at present, this is not a reality. Um, simply, and we have greater experts on, on, on this here in the hall, if you want, maybe you can ask later. Um, we just don't have the technology to effectively uh, and permanently implant such chips into the brain and, and the body. We don't understand the brain and the body well enough for these chips to be effective in any way. For instance, what can we know today, like in implanting, say, a chip in my brain, some corporation implants a chip in my, in my brain and measures all kinds of, I don't know, my blood pressure and things and my body heat and things like that. What can it possibly learn that it cannot learn much, much more easily from my smartphone? Yes. Like, if, if they want to know my political views, they should just monitor which uh, TV stations I watch, which stories I like, which mm -hmm. books I read. This will give them a much easier access to my political views mm -hmm. than trying to implant a chip in my brain and then somehow from the brain activities deduce my political views. In 50 years, yes, maybe. But not now. The, not the technology now. is simply not there. I often feel that the people who are worried about these things, it's actually a comforting thought. Why is it comforting? Because they tell themselves, well, to control me, 
they need to implant a chip in my brain. They haven't implanted a chip in my brain yet, so I'm okay, and I will resist it. And this is actually comforting because they don't understand that the smartphone which they used to read these conspiracy theories, this is the device exactly. that is controlling them. Yes. If you have a smartphone in your hand, nobody needs to implant a chip in yes. your brain. So, so it's another illusion that we, the people are living with, yeah. to think that, yes. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, we have some uh, students here, and we wanted mm -hmm. to give a chance for one of them yeah, to absolutely. ask you a question. They are our future. Where are you? Someone? Yes? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for this golden opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, my name is Vedan Bandari, and I am a student at Yang Junfu Higher Secondary School. So perhaps the biggest conundrum that we face today is the climate crisis mm -hmm. and climate change. And although we have devised solutions, these solutions only look good on paper, and they do not do justice to all the people in the world. So uh, w uh, what do you, how do you suggest that we take on this issue that humanity faces? How do we solve this doomsday issue that we have? Th thank you. Yeah, yes. I mean, and th the problem is basically political. Yes. It's not scientific or even economic. Um, what's happening now with climate change is, is a real tragedy in the sense that it is a completely preventable catastrophe. When some catastrophe happens, which is, com which is beyond human control. So it's, of course, really bad, but, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a tragedy in the sense that we didn't cause it. With climate change, not only is it our fault, but we still have the power to stop it, to prevent it, and we are not doing it because, ultimately, of political disagreements. Uh, according to the best estimates we have, in order to uh, uh, prevent catastrophic climate change, Humanity needs to invest, in addition to what we already invest, it needs to invest another 2% of global GDP every year. 2%. 2% of global GDP, which is, of course, a lot of money. But thinking in terms of the global budget, it's basically investing an additional 2% of, of humanity's budget. And this is completely feasible, in, even in political terms. Politicians are very good in shifting 2% of the budget from here to there. This is, this is their job. No this problem. is what they do all the time. And, you know, if it was like, if I told you it was, if the expert said it was 20% or 50%, then it would probably have been hopeless. Yes. Countries, except in case of total war, they never invest 50% of the budget in anything. Yes. But it's not 50%. It's just like 2%. 2 so it is feasible. Why isn't it done? Because there is political disagreement, both inside countries and also between countries. Every country expects the other countries yes. to, to make the, the bigger sacrifice. And um, the, the, also, it's a, it's a more long-term uh, uh, issue. So people think, OK, like in my term in office in the next two years or four years or five years, I will still be OK. So I can focus on the immediate problems, and somebody else will take care of the problem later on. Mm. And everybody's saying it, and then you don't have the political motivation well. to solve the problem. Mm. So uh, it's really a question of motivation, yes. and hopefully if enough people, enough citizens, enough politicians also, and politicians, you know, they're also human beings, they also care about the world. They also have children. They have friends. They want their children to grow up in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a good world. Um, if we have enough motivation, we still have the power to solve the problem. Yes. No, uh, that's very heartening. Thank you for sharing that. And I read that your organization actually did that research to show that it's an additional uh, around $2 trillion dollars to actually address the climate change. So actually, it's very doable. So that's yeah, very comforting. If, if the money really. invested now in the, in the Russian in invasion the of Ukraine race. and all yeah. the consequences would have been invested in dealing with climate change, we would have been on safe grounds. But hmm. Putin chose to, to, to invest the money elsewhere. <laughs> uh, Professor, we'll take another Slido question that's most voted. And this one says that especially, this is talking about the human uh, 
basic instincts, I guess, mm -hmm. especially in the context of corruption, favoritism, and nepotism in the human system. Wouldn't it be a good thing to use AI to make unbiased decisions? Oh, very dangerous. <laughs> very dangerous. First it's, of all, AI is biased. Absolutely, yes. We know that now for sure mathematically. Like 10 years ago when it only started, people had this fantasy that, oh, it will be completely unbiased. Now we know that AI in this sense is not so different from us. Like, how do we learn our biases? Usually during childhood, we learn biases from our parents, our teacher, from society around us. Yes. And the same thing happens to AI. AI also has a childhood. True. AI has a childhood when it is trained on, on big data. Like an AI that, I don't know, recognizes faces. To learn to recognize a face, it goes over millions of previous examples of faces to learn to recognize them. This is its childhood. And like human beings, AI has childhood traumas and childhood influences. So for instance, they found that uh, in, in the United States, there was these big researchers, that AI is, is much better at identifying white people than black people. And they wanted to know why. I mean, did, my, my, is the AI racist? <laughs> and they find out the answer, that they trained the AI on a database of publicly available images yes. of, of faces of people like politicians. So for every 100 white politicians, there were like two or three black politicians. So the AI learned better to recognize white faces. Yes. And it has now this bias. Yes. And like this, it has much more dangerous biases. True. So it has biases. And also, um, it's very dangerous, before we understand it, to give it so it's much power. power. Yes. So we need to work with it, we need to use it, but I would be extremely careful about entrusting important decisions to AI mm. before we understand it and before we have safety measures in place. For instance, to make sure that the AI is not racist. Yes, true, true. And not only that, there's a whole lot of ethical issues, the trolley problem. All this has to be reasoned out before you cede any kind of authority to technology. Uh, two very quick, short questions and short answers. Is it true that Sapiens is a collection of your lecture notes? Yes. I mean, I mean, it's not exactly and the same, but it developed out of the... Out of and the a little longer answer, maybe. Are you happy? <laughs> Am I? This is the slider oh. question. I think I'm happier than I was like 20 years ago, which is, I think, the, the, the most that we, we can aspire to. It's not a yes-no question. True, true, of course. Okay, then uh, basically, I think we've, uh, we, we can we take one, one last question from the audience, I think. So going back to AI and uh, you know, the concern that you have uh, that we really need to slow down. Um, so the lifeblood of AI is essentially data. Yeah. Uh, is there a possibility that we could slow down uh, by actually controlling access to data? And with that, I'm actually alluding to uh, what what developments that are going on with uh, Web3 and, you know, uh, uh, giving power mm -hmm. back to individuals, you know, to limit access uh, to, to data. Maybe if there are more uh, develop developments in that area, maybe if you could uh, add to that. Thanks. Yeah, th you're very right. The data is like the, 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 the um, uh, basic raw material from which to develop the, the, the AI. And what we've seen over the last few decades is that certain corporations and countries, they harvested immense amounts of data from all over the world. If you ever ask yourself, why are so many services free in, in the electronic world, in, 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 on the internet, they are not really free. You pay for them with your information that you get a lot, you don't pay money. Money is old stuff. The new currency is information. And we now have certain corporations and certain governments that harvested the data from all over the world, which goes back to what we talked about earlier, like the new, new type of imperialism. So if previously imperialism was built on raw materials like coal and oil and cotton, 
now the raw material of empires is data. And um, again, you, you harvest the data all over the world, you use it to build the most sophisticated AI tools in the imperial center, and then you send the products back to the colonies from which you got the data in the first place. It's like, you know, in, in, in British Empire in the 19th century, so you grow cotton in India, you send the cotton to Manchester, you make nice clothes in Manchester, you send them back to India to sell them. Now it's happening, you, you harvest the data, you make the AI tools, you sell back so, the AI tools. That's, that's the new uh, uh, economic type of, 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 of imperialism. And again, that's very, very dangerous. I mean, it, it's, it's a better deal to uh, not to get free services, but to have greater control of your information and get dividends. Oh, you want to use my data to produce something? Okay, but I have a share in, in the earnings. I mean, today, uh, with so much data being shifted and governments don't even know how to, how to tax data. Governments know how to tax money. Governments know how to tax raw materials, like exporting cotton, you know how to tax it. How do you tax data? This is something that governments haven't figured out. And finally, again, it goes back to the political realm, because what happens if all the private information of every politician and journalist and military officer and judge in your country is being held in another country? So, again, previously, in order to control a country, you needed to send soldiers in. Now you mainly need to take data out. Again, imagine a situation, maybe in a few years, where somebody in a different country has all the private information of all the people in this country. So they don't need to send any soldiers in. The information and the manipulation, in the, it, 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 the, the power it gives them is enough to exercise a kind of new imperial control. Mm. So not just from the perspective of slowing down the, this AI race, but also to protect the economic and political interests of the countries which are left further behind, mm. it would be good to think very carefully mm. about this, this phenomena of, of harvesting data and accumulating data from all over the world in just a few places. The dangers of data colonization. Exactly, data colonialism. And you mentioned that we're giving it because we like videos of cute kittens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, uh, that was fascinating. I think we could go on, but uh, clearly uh, the time has come to, to an end more. So, uh, one last question. I hope you'll indulge us. <laughs> you know, you wrote these uh, three amazing books. Sapiens is about where we come from, where we really come from not the type of history we learn in school where it begins with, I think, the Indus Valley Civilization, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, and the potteries that were found there. But mm. you take us through the real entire history of human beings, then you take us to what the future of humanity could, could be in, in uh, Homo Deus. And then, of course, the issues we are confronted with today in the 21 Lessons. And in all these three books you have raised so wonderfully, so many proverbs, creative questions, and also wonderful ideas like you did tonight and shared about how uh, you could begin to address some of them. But I think the important thing, like you highlight many times, is that it's about raising the right questions. So my question to you is, if we were to give you a free hand, hmm. a total free hand to go govern <laughs> and run a country like Bhutan hmm. from tomorrow, what three things would you focus on and begin working on immediately, and why? I would immediately give the power to somebody who understands the country <laughs> better than me. No, no, that's no, that, that's, no, no easy. That, 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 no, that's very important. I think a crucial thing for human beings, especially human beings in position of power, is to understand their own limitations, not to try to exceed them, not to try to do things that they are not qualified, and to delegate power. You know, there is this famous saying that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. I just come from Israel when we have people in government who don't understand this. Uh, 
I've seen so, you speak recently. So it's, it, it's, it's not a way to kind of shield responsibility. I think this is something very, very crucial. That people, all, human beings, especially when confronted by a very complicated situation, they hope that somebody very wise and powerful will come along and take responsibility away from them. He will solve it, he knows. And this is extremely dangerous, nobody can do it. That the real solution to the problems of any country is if a lot of people take responsibility for, uh, uh, for these things, each in their own sphere of activity. You know, when I think about the foundations of a country, so I think, for instance, about the sewage system. And when people, you know, they, they, in the U.S. especially, they, they, they talk about the deep state. Whenever I hear that word deep state, I think about the sewage system. That this is really the deep state. That, you know, in order to protect our health, to prevent diseases, somebody needs to dig a sewage system and separate the sewage from the drinking water. Otherwise, you have cholera, you have epidemics. And this is a very important task of people who are often not appreciated. We don't think about the people who build and run the sewage system, as the f but this is also the foundation of a country. So um, I think that we need to have co collaboration between people who understand different aspects of, of the country and not to expect a single person to come up with, with all the answers. Thank you, thank you. Truly, uh, words of wisdom, <laughs> truly words of wisdom. So with that, uh, I would like to request uh, everyone to please join me in giving Professor Yuval Noah Harari a big round of applause. <laughs> big round of applause for being so forthcoming, sharing so freely of your really deep intellect. and. Uh, we also thank you, for Professor Harari, for all that you do to, to, I guess, create this compelling story that can help galvanize people all around the world to overcome the challenges of our times. We wish you, your partner, Itzik Yahav, your family and friends, a very happy stay in our country. Thank you. And a safe return home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dashu, and of course, uh, Professor Harari. Excellencies, uh, Dashus, ladies and gentlemen, what an amazing evening it has been. And how I wish uh, it can go on for some more time. Uh, we feel sorry uh, that there are so many questions on Slido, and I'm sure there are so many people out here uh, with a lot of questions uh, to raise, but in the interest of time, uh, we have to uh, end the program now. Uh, I don't think I can do any justice uh, if I try to summarize the conversation that we have just had between Professor and Ashok Karma, but I can easily say it has been one of the most insightful, enriching, and thought-provoking talks we have organized in the last 10 years of uh, our institute's existence. And uh, it meant so much more that uh, such a profound talk came at a time when our entire country is undergoing major national transformation under the extraordinary and visionary leadership of His Majesty the King. On behalf of the governing board, management staff of our institute, I would like to express our deepest gratitude and appreciation to Professor Yuval Noah Harari for being with us tonight and for enlightening us with such an amazing talk. I do sincerely hope that this is not our last interaction, but the first of many to come in the years ahead. Thank you so much, Professor. I also take this opportunity to thank the group of very distinguished personalities uh, accompanying Dr. Harari, including, of course, uh, his husband, uh, Etzik Yahab, for visiting our country and for being a part of Dirk's dialogue tonight. We wish you all a very happy and memorable stay in our country. And we hope you fly back with a longing to return already with your families and friends. I would like to take this opportunity, of course, to thank Rajiv Karma for so ably moderating this dialogue 
and for always supporting RICS and our programs in various capacities. I truly appreciate your support. We are, of course, immensely grateful and indebted to the Honorable Prime Minister for always supporting our programs and for your gracious presence this evening, despite your very, very busy schedule. Uh, it means a lot to us uh, as an institute and also for me and my uh, colleagues at RICS. Uh, it's truly encouraging uh, for all of us working at RICS. Our thanks and appreciation are also due to the Honorable Ministers, Secretaries, Ambassadors, and other dignitaries who spared your precious Tuesday evening time to attend our program. We are equally indebted to all of you who registered online for this dialogue and for always making RICS programs more purposeful. We would have not had been able to organize tonight's event the way we did without the invaluable help and support of His Majesty's Secretariat, the Office of the Gyalpi Zimpin, the Department of National Properties, the Desung Skilling Program, especially trainer Benjamin and his students from the Stage, and stage Lights and Sound Training Program for all their hard work and for ensuring that everything goes seamlessly on the technical front. We are also thankful to the collaborative efforts of our colleagues and young Desus in the audiovisual department and the catering services department. Last but not the least, I would like to express our gratitude to the officials of the Royal University of Bhutan for their support and services in ensuring the success of our program tonight. Finally, uh, with all our prayers and hope that you will continue to shine light on millions of people and institutions around the world who are seeking purpose, direction, and meaning in life. We would like to offer Professor a small token of appreciation and gratitude. Honestly, the gift is small, both in terms of its value and its size. But the appreciation, admiration, and gratitude are indeed truly genuine and heartfelt. Thank you once again, Professor Trestelena.